Whew. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's been one of the more crazier fall seasons for me. I'll tell you what. Time is so going, and time is going so fast. I don't know why. Is it just me or is it everybody? I don't know, but man, oh man, time seems to be whizzing. It's like, I swear to God, it was just like, it seems like two minutes ago, I was hunting so hard trying to find that huge mule deer buck way up north. And all of a sudden, I just went out and did it again with a huge blacktail buck. And now I'm home. Like, it's like I'm fast forwarding through the channels. Bink, 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 bink. It's really bizarre. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> I had a uh, very, very strong gut feeling that I needed to go travel to the mainland and go to my old haunts. And because uh, deer season closes December 15th, and I just had a funny feeling I got to go. This one very, very special place that I love for years. And uh, just so everybody knows, the amount of time I spent hunting this particular area, you're lucky to see a deer one maybe once every four or five times I go I've hunted there you just don't see them that often it's a migration more of a migration route there's not much snow there uh, I'm starting to battle I'll save this for that video I'm gonna make a video about this hunt that I just did and put it on the how to hunt channel all right I'm just saying time is freaking flying and my gut told me to go and my gut told me a lot that day and it happened <laughs> I got it done it was really exciting fun fast and now I'm home and it's like a blur it's really weird to be so aware of time whizzing by. Anyway, I've got, what do we got? We have to leave sometime tomorrow again. So, Adventure Puppy's behind me. She got her, uh, she got her, uh, I give her the, the front four from the ankle to the elbow. That, that meat, that bone and meat is her little treat when I come home successful. So now she's passed out behind me. <laughs> anyway, I'm babbling. I gotta get right into sharing voices here. This is titled Mount Baker. All right, a lot of people in British Columbia grow up looking out their bedroom window and seeing Mount Baker in the distance, which is in Washington State. Hello, Steve Jacob here. Love your stuff and hope to hope to tag some blacktail of similar class to the ones you've taken someday. Haven't taken anything that was special myself, although I have a lot of photos, just can never seal the deal. <laughs> it's a common story. Anyhow, to the story. Nothing incredible, but I'll never forget this happened around the time I graduated high school in 09. I was camping with some friends along the base of Mount Baker. Not too far from the north end of Baker Lake. We stayed up late, as it was June, and... Nothing other than camping trip, no reason to wake up early. I remember hearing a monkey-like noise with shrieking and whoops. I didn't think much of it at first because I hear different owls making a variety of different noises year-round until I realized this noise was coming closer along with the sound of breaking branches. I wasn't freaked out yet as I thought maybe a bear was moving in and owls combining for a misconception of reality. Thinking it was a bear, I took a rock about the size of a golf ball and tossed it gently in the direction of the branches. Oh, so we're talking close. To let the bear know I didn't want him around. But, sorry, but about, sorry, about 20 seconds later, a similar or same rock was lofted back into our camp spot. This seeming too surreal, I decided to toss it once more with the same response. I was definitely a little unnerved, but didn't let it get to me, and just decided to ignore it. And whatever was, and whatever it was, went along making sounds, but getting further away. End of story. Anyway, best wishes from the other side of the border. Come hunt Washington with me someday. I love that man. I love that. I want to hunt Oregon and Washington for black tails with somebody one day. So that's something else to be able to shrug that one off. I don't think uh, too many of us would be able to shrug that one off. Especially the rock getting tossed back. <laughs> there you go. Man, you imagine? Yeah, I can. Alright, here's another one. This is titled, 
East Banff Bigfoot's face revealed. Hi, Steve. I took the liberty of removing the stick from across this man-like Bigfoot's face using a Photoshop-like app so you can see him more clearly. I think we'd all agree that he desperately needs a haircut. It's from a recent TikTok YouTube video from Eastern Banff area called Hunters Capture More Clear Footage of a Large Bigfoot in Your Camp, which can easily be found with a basic Google search. Share if you'd like to the community, and thanks for safe harbor. Cheers, Jim. Okay, Jim, here we go. There's another photo. How's that? Oops. Can I see? Hold on a minute. Yeah, I'm going to do this. This is the lazy way, but I'm going to do it. All right. So there you go. Another photo. Now, do I think that's legitimate? Me personally? You know my feelings on photos? No, I don't. There you go. That's just me. Shared. Some people might ask, why not? Uh, one thing I, I've learned over the years, especially with a lot of human products, clothing, a lot of camouflage, some camouflage clothing, you can see the UV glow off of it. The human eye can, so in your face, obvious. That's got the same glow for me. That's how I made my decision. <laughs> now, oh, here's another one titled Photo. Another photo. Here we go. Hello, Steve. You read one of my stories not too long ago, and you asked me to circle the being in the photo that I sent. So here it is. I haven't been back to this location since the encounter. My friend who borders the BLM land has told me that the structures that are there change size and shape constantly. I just don't feel comfortable going back there. Another friend has found footprints in the same area that measured almost 17 inches long and five and a half inches, five and a half inches across. Like I said previously in my encounter, I live around a quarter mile from this area. That encounter was in April of 2017. The next encounter was 2020. I was sitting in my car. I was sitting in my car, pot smoking. It was just starting to get dark. I was looking at my gate to my driveway which is about 60 feet from the house, when I saw a huge reddish-orange colored thing walking hunched over past my gate. I could not see his face, only a side profile. It was around six and a half to seven feet tall, hunched over. It was still light enough out to see this thing clearly. I did not see a neck, but it had a domed head slanting back with hair hanging off of its entire body. The hair was around three and a half inches long. It had a huge chest and long arms that seemed to reach its knees. I jumped up and ran out there, but by the time I reached the gate, it was nowhere to be seen. There is no way a person could have walked that fast. A couple days later, my neighbor was walking with his granddaughter in the woods not far from me, and she seen this orange-colored being watching them from the trees. She got out of there quick. This is in Central Oregon. And my name is Steve Sumpter. Thank you for giving us all a place to relate our encounters. Respectfully yours, Steve Sumpter. Okay, thanks, Steve. Well, that's an odd one, isn't it? Crazy. Sure looks like it, doesn't it? I'll load the smaller photo, so I don't think I'll get away with going like this. So I'll load that into the edit program. All right that there, load that there, and load that there. So just so you guys know, now I have to load that photo into Dropbox for my phone, crowd open Dropbox on here, download it on the computer, then put that into the edit program. <laughs> Bit of a pain in the butt, but I got it. Thanks for that share, man. Another orange being, colored hair. This is titled Topic of Importance. Steve, I'm a long time listener from even before the Bigfoot topic when you told bear hunting stories and close calls. All were great for comic relief. Comic relief. Yeah, not if you were there with me. Don't get me wrong. I'm behind the evolution of your channel. I would like to discuss a topic that has been touched on, but not, in my opinion, expanded enough. All right. 
This topic is about the scumbag controllers and so-called influencers that run our countries. These people feel they have the right to tell us what we can or can't do. And at the same time, use our money to further their wealth and their control over us. So, let's just start with the basics. If the people want more, we'll go deeper. Let's start with birth certificates. The corporate machine that runs our countries cannot interact with flesh and blood beings, only other corporations. So, what they did was get your parents to sign you over as their property via a birth certificate. This also linked you to a corporation, your name in all caps, that they have jurisdiction over and actually trade you on the market. The second item in jurisdiction, how do these people have authority over us? Able to fine, manipulate, or even imprison? The answer is we have contracts, contracted with them unknowingly. The most common being a driver's license. It is actually not required to have a driver's license to travel in North America unless you are in a commercial capacity. Think of the opening of a court case. The judge actually asked a few questions like, do you reside at or is your license and calls the name on the birth certificate which you stand and certify as you. These are all ways of their establishing jurisdiction. These people are scam artists. They are operating a scam that literally ruins lives and keeps them rich. I know this is off topic from your usually from your usual content, but I believe you're all about speaking truth and dismantling their control. So from that perspective, I thought this is noteworthy. I'm by no means a scholar on this subject, but I'm sure you have viewers that are more knowledgeable than me. Please, if this topic hits you in the center section, I'll gladly step aside as better knowledge is delivered to you. Knowledge is power. The more people that know, the easier to remove our controller's power. Thus be sovereign people again. There you go. Another concerned person wanting truth and speaking truth. It's so one thing about this channel is I've always said from the very beginning, since we started going into all these topics is <clears throat> this topic, the Sasquatch, what's going on out here in the real world is one of the easiest, easiest topics to deliver to the world to prove that we have been lied to and misled. It all ties in. This is an easy one. Why is it an easy one? Why is it a good one? It's a good one because it's so hard to believe. Right? It's so hard to believe this is going on for your average human being. But meanwhile, those of us who have seen with our own eyes, didn't ask for it, we know. Right? So, bear with me and try to pick up what I'm putting down. When you see, you know. And at the same time, that's when everything changes. And once, once you see and know, and then you turn and you face your community and you see the fact that it is so hard for people to take this truth in. Now, stay with me. I hope my brain's meshing up my lips smoothly. That, for me, is even more alarming because I see the fact that my, what troubles me is why do so many people in my community, in society, on the face of the earth have such a hard time with their minds wrapping around truth? Right? And I don't, you know, so people go, well, it's a tall, t 10 foot tall hairy man. We're not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the part where this is truth. Stake my life on it, obviously. You can't change, you can't change, you can't. You can't change my mind. This is freaking truth. Seen it with my own eyes. Done deal. That's truth. So now I'm just going to call that as truth, as an example of truth. And that hard physical truth that I've seen and experienced, the rest of my human tribe, the majority of my tribe, their brains will not accept it. And they, they got a block in there. All right. So, I'm, so what's frustrating for me is, where did we come up with this block? Who put the block in our minds to really push against truth in such a fierce way? Pushing against meaning will not accept that at all, at all costs. Laugh when you hear about the topic. Scoff, humiliate people that talk about it. How did they get so many humans to do that? <laughs> Pretty alarming, right? And I do like to think that this 
group here is jumping on board with truth, right? That's what this is about. Nope. I don't give a shit what anybody says. You can argue with me. I'll argue with you, with you till I'm purple in the face. This is not a Bigfoot Sasquatch community. This expands way further. This channel is about absolute truth, right? Nobody's in control. Nobody controls any narrative here. And everybody gets to speak their truth. It's very, very powerful, right? I can't start a battle. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, not sorry. But it is amazing. Once you realize the truth, that you just you once you see all this crazy ass shit, accept it as fact because you have to. There's no there's nothing else you can do about it. And then you start talking to tens of thousands of human beings around the globe that know the same truth. And you start wondering, how did whoever, whatever it is, whoever it is, how did they so successfully manipulate the shit out of us, the majority of us? to scoff at and ignore truth. It's alarming, right? It's alarming. But once you can do that to somebody, you can actually get them to go out of their way to kill a whole shit pile of people for you. Right? And get humans to do anything. That's alarming. Babbling. <laughs> this is titled Man on a Bicycle. Hi. Thank you for your channel. I've been listening to your channel for a while now, even though I don't usually watch videos about Bigfoot because there's... Never any new info. <laughs> oh, yes, there is. People just don't see it. I have had many experiences, but never involving Bigfoot, or so I thought. I was just watching one of your videos. It shocked me. So I'm writing. I live on the edge of a gravel pit and walk my dogs along the edge. We stay in the woods on our side and down in the pit. We stay in the woods on our side and down in the pit at our edge. We have a nice sized lake here and it's still unfinished and is posted no trespassing or hunting or fishing, but we are allowed to use it because we all live on the edge. One morning I saw a man coming our way dressed in all black, hood, and all coming very fast around the lake. Sorry, let me read that sentence again. One morning I saw a man coming our way dressed all in black, hood and all coming very fast around the lake. My first thought was someone's dog was running over here toward us, but as it, it neared it, missing punctuation, as it neared, it was too big and too fast and it had to be a man. And then I thought, it's moving too slowly. Oh, sorry, it's moving too smoothly to be a man running. And my next thought was, this didn't seem right. And I better get the dogs out of here before they see it. This is moving really fast. I called the dogs to me as quickly as I quickly scaled the hill toward home. Our German Shepherd will stop in a dime when called and run as fast as he can for home when called. I got them out of the pit just as he, whatever, rounded the curve toward our side of the lake. I got the dogs in the house as fast as I could and closed the door. And that was it. I didn't think it could have been a Bigfoot until just now when I heard this story on your program. I never would have thought Bigfoot could live in this area of Michigan. Up until now, I've had many experiences indoors. One more time. Up until now, I have had many experiences indoors and only in the midnight hours. I've had those experiences since I was a little kid. I've come to the conclusion that they are evil. Anyone who's, who experiences the dread knows this. When I was a kid, I prayed for God to protect me. Later, I found they will leave reluctantly when you command them to leave in Jesus' name, but they also may return later. Now I found that commanding them to leave in Yahshua's name and mentioning Yahweh. Yahava is much more effective. Needless to say, I don't tell anyone. I made that mistake a few times years ago. I never intended to write to you either. I do enjoy listening and would really like to know what this is. But maybe I really don't. Maybe, maybe not. Everybody has different reactions, right? Some want to know. Some don't want to even acknowledge that they just saw or heard something. That's fine. I don't know why, but gravel pits seem to have been a, a common 
what you might call a pattern of where they're seen geographically. Geographically? Gravel pits. Don't know why. Gravel pits have been a very popular place to run into these beings. Here's another one titled Sabe Detection. Steve, I spent over 30 years in radiation detection and protection. All right. I tried to donate so I could watch the new video, but was unable to figure it all out. Still working on that. Just go to desktop. Desktop view on your phone or desktop laptop computer. Then it shows up. There are several types of radiation. Gamma, beta, alpha, neutron, for example. Geiger counter instruments cannot detect all of these types and in fact, very limited. Oh, interesting. I, I don't know shit about radiation. There are natural and man-made sources of radiation. Not knowing how much info on this subject has been shared with you from your scientists, friends, or included in Dr. Ketchum video, I hesitate to continue. It would be very lengthy. However, the fact that radiation is associated with the Sabe people is very fascinating and somewhat strange. Either the Sabe is generating the radiation from within itself, or the Sabe has been somewhere that radioactive material has collected on its body and fallen off where it was detected near where it was standing. Please feel free to email me if you're interested in more complex explanation. Okay, man. You already know my answer. I'm absolutely interested. And I know that there's going to be a lot of people here listening to this channel that are interested too. They're following along and soaking up all the information. So, yes, please. Please email more. And hopefully, you can in your delivery, um, because it's going to be a topic that a lot of us aren't familiar with. There's going to be a lot of components to what you know that are just going to sound like Chinese. So take that. Me as an example, being as simple as a stick at times. Deliver it so that I can pick it up. Okay? I'm very interested. And also, could you please deliver to us what is the best form of personal item that can detect the radiations? If you could. I'm interested in that. Thanks for emailing me. I appreciate that. Appreciate it. Appreciate everybody emailing. Always. All right. Here's another one. This came in in 2021. This is titled Invisibility Slash Cloaking. Hi, Steve. I've been listening to the stories on your channel for a few months now, and I think what you were doing is most helpful for many people. Thank you. My main story is a detailed experience. Story number one. Story number two is like a PS relating to quick sightings. All right, here we go. Story one. You asked folks to send info about invisibility or cloaking recently, so here it goes. This took place back in 1980 when I was 16 years old. I'm from Mobile, Ana Mobile Ana Alabama. But my daddy is originally from West Tennessee, the area just south of Paris near Kentucky Lake. It was fall, and we drove up for a couple of days to visit my grandma and uncle near the town of Mackenzie. My uncle had gotten into, into genealogy, and mentioned there was an old lost family cemetery he wanted to look for out in the woods. So of course, daddy and I wanted to go look for it too. My aunt and cousin weren't interested in going and mama stayed behind at the motel to watch TV. So it was just the three of us heading out into the woods that afternoon. We drove to the area my uncle wanted to search, park the car and set out. I think my uncle had looked for this graveyard before, but had been unable to find it. So he was glad to have help. He's glad to have help. Daddy enjoyed spending time with his older brother, and I was enjoying just walking in the beautiful Tennessee hardwood forest. In South Alabama, our woods are full of longleaf pines that, with thick undergrowth full of briars and snakes. Up here, I love being able to see the ground covered with a thick layer of fallen leaves. You can see through the trees, too. It was a couple of steps behind Daddy and my uncle just taking it all in and wishing I could live around these kinds of woods. The afternoon was overcast and there was a chill in the air. I was glad to be wearing a blue jean jacket that an old boyfriend of mine had outgrown. It was from the boys department at Sears and Roebuck. Worn out, faded blue with white pile lining. 
Daddy and my uncle were softly chatting with each other, and the only other sound I remember was the crunch of the dried leaves with every step. The woods were a mix of soft browns, moss green grays, and some gold. I was looking down at the leaves as I walked, trying to see any signs of old gravestones or dreaming about having four seasons instead of two. There was a tree in front of me. As I glanced up, Daddy was ahead of me, to my right, and my uncle was to the right of him. And just then, I felt two hands grab me by the shoulders of that jean jacket and move me to the side, closer to Daddy. I actually felt my feet lift off the ground a bit, but there's nobody there. I didn't scream. I didn't feel threatened. I was, however, very confused and shocked. As your grandfather would say, I was concerned. I took a couple steps forward and called out to Daddy. He and my uncle stopped and turned around. I told them what happened. How I was walking along when somebody, when, sorry, when suddenly I was grabbed by the shoulders and scooted to the side. They looked at each other and walked back to me. Daddy asked if I was hurt. I said no. He then asked exactly where it had happened and I told him, right there, just in front of that tree. He asked, what tree? I turned around and pointed and said, that tree. But there was no tree there now. I am certain that my mouth fell open at that point. I was so confused. I walked where the tree had been and there were only leaves on the ground. The other trees were too far from where I had been, so I could only look at Daddy and say, there was a tree right there. Now, you must understand about these men with me. My uncle was born in 1923 and Daddy was born in 1925, both World War II veterans. Both were typical of the men of that age in that they had put away their belief in old wives' tales, old wives' tales and superstition, and had embraced science, logic, and reason. But still... They could tell by my face and demeanor that something had indeed happened. Daddy knew I wasn't a liar, and he knew I didn't play jokes or tricks on people. He walked up, put his arms around me, and said, Well, maybe it's one of your ancestors who grabbed you. Maybe you're about to step in a hole or twist your ankle, so they moved you to safety. That sounded like as good an explanation as any. So, I nodded in agreement and said, Yeah, that's probably it. My uncle said it was time we headed back to the car anyway, before it started getting dark. And he got no argument from me. Side note, my brain just said, isn't it, or focused on, isn't it funny that we have all humans, all humans, we've been conditioned to get out before dark, get home before dark, come in before dark, get in when it gets dark. Pattern, why is that? Seriously, think about it. Why is that? For reals, think about it. Really, truly think about why it is all across every single human society, camp, village, whatever. Every one of us has always said to the children, you got to get in before dark. Or even us, got to get in before dark. Why is that? Everything that's alive is still going to be there in daylight. Right? All wildlife's still there in daylight. Got a flashlight. Who gives a shit if it's night or dark? You got a flashlight or whatever. See what I'm getting at? But really, truly think about it. Why? Why have all human beings been conditioned to fear the dark? Maybe that's not direct fear, but still, we got to get out of here. Let's get dark. We've got to go. Why? Seriously, why? Right? Something else is there with that. I hope I'm making sense today. I don't feel like I am with my mouth. My brain is, as usual. <laughs> This experience was a puzzle. Daddy's explanation seemed just as likely as anything else, so I chalked it up to a ghost or guardian angel. Just one of the many weird things that would happen to me in years to come. I never considered Sasquatch because I thought they were only in the Pacific Northwest. Mama's side of the family from Clark County, Alabama, had always warned us not to be out at night or the boogers will get you. Hmm. I now understand what slash who the boogers or wood boogers are. They are our southeastern version of Sasquatch. After hearing stories of how they can take themselves, take sorry, how they can make themselves look like trees or stumps and generally blend into the background, I came to the conclusion that it just may have been a Sasquatch, cloaked, 
as a tree or I got too close to, so they moved me to one side, then vanished. What do you think? We lost my uncle a few years ago, but daddy's still running around as in and, and is in great shape for a 95 year old. My uncle's hobby also uncovered our Cherokee heritage, which had been hidden on mama's side. There is Indian blood as well. I'm just not sure if it's Creek or Choctaw or both. But hey, many Southern Southerners have some native blood. I've often wondered if that genetic link makes us more sensitive to certain things. Anyway, I am glad I was believed that day in the woods. Daddy and my uncle were very kind to me. And I feel so lucky and blessed to have had them with me. Story number two. While I have not seen a Sasquatch, I have seen what I now believe to be a dogman twice. Uh-oh. The first time I was driving south on I-65 at night, south of Birmingham, on my way to Mobile. I ran in, it ran in front of me, crossing the road very fast from east to west. My headlights gave me a, gave me a good, if fleeting, look. It was big on all fours running fast. It was dark with pointed ears and a long muzzle like a German Shepherd. How many times have we heard that identical description? It scared me so bad. I always worry about a deer jumping in front of me at night, but I had no idea what this thing was when it happened. It was too big to be a dog or even a wolf. Plus it was moving so fast. I was going through all the animals I could think of in my head and still did not know what had just run out in front of me. Over 10 years later, it happened again. This time in West Texas. It was on a two, it was on a two lane, which ran between Abilene and San Angelo, San Angelo, sorry, San Angelo. Maybe it was US 277. Anyway. It was a dark night and a narrow road, out in the middle of nowhere. There were lots of hills and curves on this road, so I had to keep slowing down to handle the twists and turns. Then, just like before, I'm headed south, and one of these things runs across the road, east to west in front of me. It looked just like the one I had seen in Alabama. When I got to the hotel in San Angelo, I told the kids at the front desk what I had seen and asked them, if they knew what kind of animal it was. They just laughed, kind of nervously, and said, I wasn't the only one to have seen some sort of mystery animal and that maybe it was a chupacabra. In the past year of listening to people's cryptid stories, I learned about dogmen. I never heard such a thing. When I researched it a bit more, sorry, when I researched it a bit more, I realized these people were describing the thing I had seen run out in front of me. It's nice to know that others had seen these beings too. Now that I had an idea what it was, the question became, why? I don't believe this happened to me by pure chance. It feels like both beings wanted me to see them. Like a shot across the bow. It's like the boy on the field trip who stopped to look at a turtle and said, are we somehow marked? Like him, I have had numerous strange things happened to me over the years. No. Oh, how I would love to talk to Turtle Boy. Sounds like he would understand all the strange, unexplained UFO, psychic, paranormal stuff I've had to deal with over the years. But like he said, how do these beings find us? To me, it feels like I am being monitored, or they are just letting me know that they know I am there, or have moved, or whatever. That's more of a UFO thing, which I won't go into here. But still, how, cer how are certain people singled out for sightings or other interactions? I wonder about genetics, native, or perhaps we give off some vibration, which lets these beings know we have encountered them before. This is getting too long now, so I'll stop. I hope if you share my experience, it'll help someone out there. So many of us had have had things happen to us we can't really explain and many get no support. Many of my other experiences would label me as a nutcase, so I keep it quiet. Your channel has made me feel safe enough to talk about the cryptid encounters. Everyone needs to understand 
that there are more things in the woods and skies and this world in general than we know. We need to support each other and share our knowledge with others when we can. Thanks again for the service you're providing. I'm sending you and all your listeners love and support. I don't want you to say my name. I have to protect certain family members' careers, so just call me V. V, I absolutely appreciate you emailing emailing in. So many people. There is a shit pile of people that are going to be relating to what you just said and shared. A lot of people. A lot. The tag thing, I don't know. Am I tagged? I don't know. I haven't a clue. I know I'm aware. I'm aware of a lot, I'm aware of, a lot of things. And I, and I follow a lot of other topics. Not just this one. But... I was going to say... Tag, tag, tagged. We're going to find out about that right when I, when I go to the South. We're going to find out. We're going to find out a lot when I go to the South. Am I going to see and experience the same things that Dr. Ketchum and other people have seen with their own eyes and experience down there? I don't know. I haven't a clue. So what I'm saying is, I don't know how the people are chosen to become aware of all this and experience things. I don't have a clue. Am I convinced it has something to do with indigenous native blood? No. No, I'm not. Only because at first I did think so, but not so much now because of all the people here. It has become quite plain and obvious to me that it doesn't matter where you come from. doesn't matter what flavor of blood's in your veins, what color your skin is. It doesn't matter if you live rurally or you got an office job. Everybody's seeing these things and everybody has, is receiving basically the same reactions and receiving the beat. They're receiving the same experiences across the board. And everybody's being treated basically the same from these beings that they're experienced, that they are experiencing across the board. Got to admit, right? But there is a lot of rural native communities still, especially in North America, indigenous communities. And, um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of rural communities, period that have more than average experiences with these beings than um, more suburban areas, right? So that is why I think possibly the native North Americans still do seem to have a lot of experiences because they live typically near real good food sources and rurally. I'm babbling, I hope it made sense there. <laughs> anyway, people are gonna chime in, people are gonna relate. We're going to get some answers. We're getting answers. Believe it or not, we are getting a lot of answers by going about doing this the way we're doing it. It's the only way. It's the only way to get answers for all sorts of stuff. All right, one more. I got to get going. This is titled Strange Experience. Hey, my name is Joe Russo. Feel free to use the story and share my name. I don't care. I've never seen or heard anything like the other viewers at this of this channel. I live in the city of Farmingham, Massachusetts, a very densely populated area with plenty of residents and businesses. Although there is a decent sized stretch of woods behind my house that spans the length of a few towns. Back behind my house is a very popular local spot for dirt bike and ATV riders. I've been there riding several times and I've also been in the woods in my area I never had anything like this happen to me. One day I was riding alone. Something I try not to do for safety, but hey, sometimes you gotta just ride, right? So I'm riding my normal path down the trail. And about a mile in, I started to feel extremely panicked. I felt like something was on top of me or following me. I became very uneasy. I immediately started looking around. I thought there was a person following me or something of that sort, so I became agitated. I stopped, shut down my bike, only to still have the same panicked feeling of being watched or followed. There's nothing there. Not one sound either. Not a bird, not a crunch of leaves. It was late this fall, by the, by the way, around early November. Just silence. I called out to see if someone, a person, was there. I heard absolutely nothing. Not an ounce of 
no, not, not an ounce of sound, just silence. Still having these panic feelings, I immediately jumped onto my quad and ripped back up the trail, checking behind me every 10 seconds or so. I saw nothing. I've since re I have since returned to this area and had no experience with those type of feelings again. I've only told the story to one person before and was hoping you would have some insight to my experience. Thank you, Steve. Keep up the good work. Love your channel, Joe. Okay, man. Uh, well, when was this? I don't even know how long ago you sent this in. It was a while back, right? So I imagine if you're still here watching this channel, you've learned a lot. You've learned that's possibly a pattern when it comes to odd experiences with people out there in the real world, right? Sarah just had that happen here down the road. <sighs> Two weeks ago. She was walking down the hill next to the big timber where she smelt that disgusting, nasty scent and said that it felt like somebody was right behind her. Right behind her. Freaked her right out. Out of the loop. Broad daylight. Anyway, you're going to learn just as much as I know just from listening to everybody here when it comes to that what you experienced, all right? Okay, now what's this one? Hold on. Unexplainable Tracks. It's the title of this email. Now titled Red. All right, one more. One more, one more. Hello, I think your name is Steve. I'm a resident of Silverdale, Washington, US. I just reviewed your YouTube, The Facts, by HowToHunt.com. Years ago, around 1980 or so, I was traipsing around in the Olympic Mountains looking for cougar sign with a friend. On game trails, up the side of the mountains and below the snow line, we had come across cougar scrapes, so we knew there were cougar in the area. We covered many miles into the Enchanted Valley area, the Buckhorn Wilderness area, and surrounding landscape. We would cover known trails, but always ventured off trail predominantly. To say off trail means way off trail. Putting things accurate, up the side of a mountain no normal man would dare, and cliffs were a nuisance. We climbed above the tree line and onto deep snow-covered peaks one day. A mile or so across the narrow peak line, we rounded an outcropping, dog leg to the right and heading west. The snow was disturbed at the other side of the out the snow was disturbed at the other side of the outcropping and we got excited. Thinking there may be a cougar around, we studied the mess. The only discernible tracks were heading west. We walked no more, no more than 20 feet to see the tracks closer. The tracks were heading at about a 10 degree angle, but down slope and along the ridge. We noticed through the deep snow, the tracks looked like the gait of a human. Mark said, there's no toe drag. He was right. So we moved down. So we moved down close to the tracks. The spread between was about three and a half feet and the snow was at least four feet deep. <laughs> the tracks were at least three feet deep into the snow. The top layer of snow crusted a bit harder than the underneath, than that underneath. I tried to move some snow from a track to look for a footprint. Too much snow was falling in to tell us just what the track was from. We both got a bit anxious and concerned at what was unexplainable. We decided to leave the area. We went home. I've never told a soul about it until now. I thought at the time the tracks had to be from something very tall as I tried to match the stride. Matching that stride, I would have to... Matching that stride, I would have to have legs at least six feet long. Besides, the track post holes were oblong and ten inches wide with rounded edges and at least size 20. I thought a Bigfoot, but was not mentally prepared to accept that. Today, I do believe those tracks were from a creature that had to be at least 11 feet tall. I wish there were cell phone cameras back then to prove what we saw. Okay, man. You, you, all, you know you're not alone, right? You know you're not alone. That camera's screwing up. No, it's still working. So many people seeing those tracks, but then the, the real creepy part, picture that, now that you have seen those tracks, you've seen the depth, the size, the stride, right? There's no, there's no faking that shit. 
Now, how about this one? So you guys are, obviously, you guys are good hunters. You know what you're looking at up there. Now, imagine seeing those tracks and following them, and all of a sudden, they just stop. <laughs> what? Right? They just stop. That's it. No more. How do you explain that one, right? And that's almost, almost, unfortunately, that's been uh, witnessed how many times, right? Amongst other abnormal things that we are now allowed to know about on average and we are programmed to scoff at or fight all right this gopro is overheating i don't know why but they commonly do that the newer ones and it shuts down <laughs> oh man recording is so challenging for me lately it's driving me a little bit bonkers but i'll get through it anyway um i think i'm going to hopefully as soon as i get back from this next trip um, I'm going to get a hold of Melba, Dr. Melba Ketchum, and I think we're going to do part two because I have a lot of other questions that I needed to ask her, which I believe she can answer directly, and it'll be very, very helpful uh, knowledge. Interesting. Probably alarming and scary, right? But I'm going to do that. Um, what else? The link to our conversation is in the description below. And what else? This is my new favorite lucky hunting hat right here. <laughs> and there's 13 of them left. And I think Sarah's got them on sale in the store. store. The link's below for that as well. I'm babbling. My mind is scrambling this morning. I got a lot to do. And hopefully the next time I come back, I'll be a little smoother. And I'll get a lot more voices heard. And I got a lot more shit I want to share. But right now, I got to get moving. I'll be back.